All right, everybody, welcome. It's good to see you here. We're starting today our verse by verse through the book of Revelation. Are you excited about this? Yes. I'm excited as well. Um, we, uh, let me set my timer here, make sure. If I go a little over, I go a little over, I guess, right? But um, we've been looking forward to this. About a month ago, we finished our verse by verse Bible study through John. And uh, people are like, well, you said you do Revelation. Well, I had to take a couple weeks off to rest and then try to figure out where's the best place to do it and when to do it. And what a blessing. Now we can do it in front of a, a live studio audience, right? I, I feel like Les Feldick, huh? <laughs> That's what people tell me sometimes. They go, you're the Les Feldick for young people. Because Les Feldick's more for old people. And he uses the old chalkboard. You use the new modern uh, whiteboard. I'm like, oh, man, you're flattering me. You're flattering me. All right, so let's get started today. We're going to look at the book of Revelation. And there's a lot to get into here. So get your Bible out and turn with me to the book of Revelation. Now, I have to start there. It's the book of Revelation, singular. One of my pet peeves is <laughs> when people say the book of Revelations, and I'm just like, no, no, what does verse 1 say? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Sometimes you have a pet peeve that when you hear a word, it's just like, you know, someone on a chalkboard, shh, with their nails. And so when someone says revelations, I kind of go, oh, it's not, no, say revelation, please say revelation. Now, I'll give you another example. My grandpa in Oklahoma, he used to say crick when we'd go down to the creek. And I just like, no, it's not a crick. That's what you get in your neck when you don't sleep well, you know. But he'd say crick instead of creek. And my wife sometimes, well, before we got married, she'd say aunt. And I told her, honey, I don't know what an aunt is. You can't say that. You can't say that. Okay, honey. And so one day we're driving down the road after we're married, and she says, well, my aunt this. And I go, who? And my aunt, who? My aunt. I go, oh, yeah, what happened to your aunt? So there's just certain words sometimes that's our pet peeves that we do or don't like. And I just don't like it when people say the book of Revelations with an S on the end. It's the book of Revelation. That's what my Bible says, the Revelation. Now, I guess technically there's more than one Revelation here, but the whole thing put together, all the ones he got, is in one. So to me, I like it better as the Revelation because it includes all that was given to him, which, by the way, was given to us. Now, who is the author of this book? Who was it written by? John. Eh, right? Oh, Wrong. Who wrote the book? Who wrote Jesus the Bible? Christ. God. So let's read verse 1 through 3 and let's say that. Okay, I knew I'd get somebody on that one. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1 through 3. Let's just read that real quickly. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. All right? There's a lot in there, but in the first verse, look what it says. The revelation of who? It's not the revelation of John. So it's the revelation of who? Jesus. But it says, which God gave into him. Who would that be? We know Jesus is God. So would that be the Father? So the author is the Father. So it's the Father that's really giving it, and the Father is giving it to who? Jesus. To the Son, Jesus. Who's giving it to who? John. To John. <laughs> Who's giving it to who? Us. It says to us, servants. Mm -hmm. So you get that, and, and so it's like, wow. So it's a revelation from the Father to the Son, to John, to us. So isn't that interesting? I don't know if you ever thought about that, but the author is definitely God, okay? So not man, but yet, God let him write some things in there. Like the end is him saying, even so, come Lord Jesus. Because he saw this whole thing. He's like, man, let's get this thing over with. And Lord, please come back today. So that's who it is. So the author then would be Jesus. Because Jesus is God. Go to Revelation twenty-two sixteen, And in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16, we read Jesus speaking. So as the author, he's speaking. So as you read through it, you're reading Jesus' words. And you're reading God's words because even when John did write something, who was in him? The Holy Spirit. So he's writing and it's the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, God's inspired words. Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. And uh, it says, and the bright and morning star. So does it get more plain than that? Jesus says, I, Jesus, you know giving you this. So it's written down 
by John. And we know John is the author. Now you get into these so-called Christian scholars, they always seem to be blockheads. They always seem to mess things up. And a lot of these Christian scholars, we don't know who wrote the book of <laughs> Revelation. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> verse 4, John to the seven. Uh, well, we don't know which John that is. Oh, why do they have to be like that? Well, we do know who, which John it is if you actually read. Amen. I wonder if these scholars can read sometimes. Because we have many church fathers. And there's a church father called Justin Martyr who lived somewhere between 100 to 169 A.D., all right? He wrote in his dialogue with Trypho in chapter 81 that the author of Revelation was John the Apostle of the Lord. He goes on to say that John was one of the apostles of Christ who prophesied by a revelation that was made to him that those who are in Christ would dwell a thousand years in Jerusalem. And we believe in that. We believe in the literal thousand-year rule of Jesus, and we believe we're going to be those with them. Because look at verse 5. Uh, verse 6, excuse me. Verse 6, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And amen. So someday I'm going to be a king amen. in the millennial kingdom. Amen? So what a blessing that will be. So we know who the author is. Now, right now, we're already smarter than many of your so-called Bible scholars. Because <laughs> we know who the author is, and we actually looked at historical documents and said, no, it was John the Apostle. And right here in the front page of my Bible, it says, The Revelation of St. John the Divine. So that would be John the Apostle. Now, when was it written? Now we get into this. There's a thing out there called preterist. And a preterist is someone who comes along and says, Well, I believe the book of Revelation is all past. And it's all over. That's what they believe. And again, they must not read. Preterists believe that the book of Revelation was written early, about 50 or 60 A.D. So while Paul the Apostle was still alive. And it's like, no, dude. Can you guys read? Why is there such a thing as preterism? Well, the preterists teach that it was written way before 70 A.D. in the fall of Israel, or excuse me, the fall of Jerusalem. Do you know what happened in 70 A.D.? Jerusalem fell, all the Jews were kicked out. And they try to make all of the book of Revelation past history. And here's why they do it, because they only read the first three verses and they don't read the rest of it. That's usually how it goes, right? You read a couple verses, you go, well, I criticize that book. That's what your scholars are. They're critics. That's, right. That's what they call um, their study of the Bible, textual criticism. Mm -hmm. Do you like critics? You know, they're all a bunch of Siskel and Ebert. So like, oh, like this with the Bible. It's like, no, I'm like this with the Bible. No, I, I think it says what it means. It means what it says. So I'm not a preterist. I don't believe it's past. But here's what they say. The revelation of Jesus Christ, verse 1, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So they say, it was written just to show you things that will pass in the next 20, 30 years. And uh, they go down to verse 3, for the time is at hand. So they say, see? Now again, who wrote the book? If John wrote the book, then we can say, okay, yeah, he's writing the prophecy of something that's going to happen in a couple of years. But who wrote the book? God. And in 2 Peter 3, 8, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So if God's the author, and he's looking down, and here we are 2,000 years later, and we're starting to see this stuff coming to pass, in God's eyes, that's just like two days. So God's writing, he goes, let me tell you what's going to happen about two days from now. In his time, in his calendar, <laughs> and for us, we're like, it seems like forever. Well, yeah, 2,000 years is a long time. But you know what? It's, it's still future. There's a lot of future in this book. Now, there's a lot of present as well. And there's some past. So I believe past, present, future. And I think we'll see that as we get into the text, which was, which is, which is to come. That's past, present, and future. So why do they try to always just make it all past? If the book of Revelation is all completed prophecy and it's all over, why even read it? You're wasting your time. So why do they even speak then? If they're right, then shut up! <laughs> because you've got nothing to offer me except don't read the book. No, I think we should read the book because it's to us, the servants of, of Christ, right? So I don't even listen to their silly arguments. And it's so sad to hear people say, no, the whole book's all past. It's just, it's really sad to see things like that. Let me give you some examples of how it has to be future. Because it's kind of fun when you deal with the preterists to show them what it actually says. Again, do they even read it? And then ask them, so when did this happen? Let's look at a couple of examples. Revelation eleven fifteen. 15. Revelation eleven fifteen. 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. All right, when did that happen? If Jesus is reigning right now, 
What a mess. <laughs> is Jesus in charge of the earth right now? I don't think so. I think the devil is. He's the God of this world, little G, and he's the one that's running everything, if you will, and all that kind of stuff. So you got to watch out for him. Go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. Now remember, last week we looked at ecumenicalism. What is ecumenicalism? All those that claim to be Christians get together. How do I get together with the preterist who says it's all past and it's all done? I can't. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Have we all been reigning for a thousand years with Jesus? Which thousand years? The first thousand or the last thousand? It's been almost 2,000 years since this book was written. Come on, man. <laughs> Who says that, you know? Come on, man. Really? Jesus is reigning for, well, he's reigning spiritually in the heavens. Well, he's not doing a very good job, is he? Yeah. I mean, the world's a mess. Come on, Lord. I mean, you're supposed to be reigning and we're supposed to be with you. I'm not in office, am I? I'm not, you know, I don't want to be a politician. They asked one preacher, do you want to be president? He said, I would not take the demotion because the greatest calling is to be a pastor and a preacher and a missionary. I would not take the demotion of demeaning myself to become a president. You know what I mean? So uh, you look at that. Let me give you another example. I think I have another one here. Revelation 22.5. Revelation 22, 5. How is this past? Revelation 22, 5. And there shall be no night there, and they, they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them a light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Well, we're reigning forever and ever right now, aren't we? I guess we'll never die, will we? We're reigning right No. I think this is all future when it all ends, and then Jesus is reigning for a thousand years, and then we reign with him forever and ever. So we look at this book, the book of Revelation, and we see what I say is... A little bit of past during the time of him while he's writing, a little bit of present, a lot of it is applying to us today, and a whole lot of still future events. Now, the book of Revelation has 22, oh, I forgot to tell you, so before we get to the chapters, um, when was it written? I did tell you who wrote it, but when was it written? Those people that are preterists say it was written about 50 to 60 A.D., before the fall of Jerusalem. And so they make the fall of Jerusalem, all that was fulfillment of this. So Jesus reigned for a thousand years after that, then what? We're past the millennium now, according to them? That doesn't make sense. So if you go to history, which you should, and you look at history, you find very clearly when it was written. There are different views to the time when the book of Revelation was written. Some, the preterists, believe it was written during the reign of Nero. Well, let me show you these guys here. Here are all of the Caesars of Rome. Well, not all of them, but around the time of Christ and then after in the early church. And when you actually study history, you can't become a blockhead like a lot of these so-called Bible scholars. Yeah. They're following men who probably weren't even saved. They're not following the Bible. Just read the Bible and study history for yourself. Well, the preterists believe that it was written sometime during the reign of Nero, so that would be 54 to 68 AD, or during the reign of Vespasian, or, or something like that. And so they suggest an early writing for the book of Revelation, and they say that the seven churches were those that existed at that time, and that all that it said there to them, it's all over, it's all done. That does not make sense. Do you know we have witnesses? The Bible says that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Amen. All right, do we believe that? Amen. All right, if I showed you some witnesses that said that the book was written between 90 to um, 100 AD, would you believe that? Well, as a matter of fact, we happen to have that. Yep. Irenaeus, who lived about 130 to 202 AD, claims to have had a personal connection with the Apostle Paul through a man named Polycarp. So you have... Uh, I said Paul, John, John through Polycarp. So John and then Polycarp and then Arrhenius. You can, you can see these guys. And this one led this one to the Lord who led this one to the Lord. Isn't it amazing that we can go back 2,000 years and we know history like to the day of what happened? Because the Romans kept records. Arrhenius says that the book of Revelation, for that it was, he says his words, for that was seen no very long time since, but almost in our day toward the ends of the reign of Domitian is when it was written. So Arrhenius, an eyewitness, says Domitian. So in the time of Domitian, the book was written. When is that? Way after 70 AD, right? So are we going to listen to preterists? Heck no, man. You don't know what you're talking about. That's just one witness. 
Victorinus, who died in about 303 AD. Victorinus, no, not the Victorinox, you know, little knife, you know, like the Swiss Army knife. Oh man, I had to put a knife thing in there. Knives are cool in Axis 2 channel on YouTube. Okay, Victorinus <laughs> writes, when John said these things, he was in the island of Patmos, condemned to the labor of the mines by Caesar Domitian. There, therefore, he saw the apocalypse. So there's two witnesses that say it was written about this time. Here's one more, Eusebius. He was born about 260 to 265, and, and uh, he died around 339 AD. Eusebius records that John was sent to the island of Patmos by Domitian, and that when those who had been unjustly banished by Domitian were released by his successor, Nerva, the apostle returned to Ephesus. So, here is, and this is pretty cool to be able to look at all this and when they reigned, but this right here is when it happened. So how on earth could that book have been written in 70 AD? When we have three witnesses of history that says, no, it was during this guy's reign. So somewhere between, I would say, probably 90 to 100 AD is when it was written. Now, it's neat to study history. When I was in Honduras, I ordered some old Roman coins. You could buy them on eBay, and they were all dirty. They found them in a landfill. And you're supposed to soak them in olive oil for a week, and then soak them in lemon juice for a week. And I went like that for a couple months and would use a toothbrush and clean them off. One of them was a coin from Vespasian. Another one was a coin from Trajan. And then one time I found a coin from Hadrian. I think I sold all those. But Hadrian's Wall, you remember Hadrian's Wall? You could still go there and see that today, and it divides Scotland from England, if I remember correctly. So, interestingly enough, we have proof that the book was written somewhere between 90 to 100 A.D. So, why would you listen to anyone who's a preterist? They have lost all credibility, have they not? Not only are they going against the Bible, they're going against witnesses of when it was written. So, the book was written around 90 to 100 A.D. And by the way, John is called the aged, remember? So he did live to be probably 100 years old. Some people like Fox's Book of Martyrs have him a little over 100, if I remember correctly. How many chapters in the book? 22 chapters. And with the 22 chapters, there's 404 verses, okay? Now, how many words are in the book of Revelation in our King James Bible? This has got to be more than just coincidence. Do you know how many words are in the King James Bible in the book of Revelation? This is incredible to me. 12,000 even. Now, why is that amazing? Well, to me, it talks about the 144,000 in that book, and there's 12,000 from every tribe. And there just happens to be exactly 12,000 words in the book of Revelation. You think that's a coincidence? Our God's a God of numbers. There's lots of numbers in the Bible, and we'll get to it here in a minute. God uses the number seven a lot. And in the book of Revelation, man, there's a lot of number sevens, a lot of them. So I just find that amazing. I just go, wow, that's pretty cool. Now, the book of Revelation has 22 chapters, and when you go through the book of Revelation, you see some amazing stuff. Chapter 4, a door is open in heaven, and somebody goes up. That's a type of the church. That's John, but he's a type of the church. So in chapter 4, heaven is opened. Let's read it. Chapter 4. Uh, go to Revelation chapter 4, and it says, Heaven opened, if I remember right. And after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Okay, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as, and he goes on. So that's a type of the rapture. That's a type of the church leaving. We don't see a door open again until chapter 19, and then somebody comes down. Well, let's look at that. That's uh, Revelation 19.11. Revelation 19.11 says, And I saw heaven opened. And it goes on there. What happens? Jesus comes. So somebody goes up and it says heaven opened or a door opened in heaven. And I saw heaven open. Here comes down. So you've got to remember to rightly divide the book of Revelation and remember that. So we see a whole lot of visions of things that are in heaven and things that are happening on the earth. But it's happening here in this time. It's not, not us, the church, that's in it. A lot of people try to say, we are saved, we're going through the tribulation. Well, we're already in tribulation, because tribulation is problems and sorrow and sickness. and That we're going through. But the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven-year tribulation, we don't go through that, because that's for the Jews. So this book, this book of Revelation, is to the servants, that's us, and we can read it. But you know, those are going to be servants, too, of Jesus, when they come to Jesus, the Jews. So the book of Revelation, a lot of it has to do with Israel. So when we read it, we need to realize a lot of it has to do with Israel. Now, the word 
revelation comes from the Greek word apokalupsis. Apocalypse is where we get that word. Apo, meaning to take away, and kaluma, a veil. So it's like we're veiled, we can't see, and all of a sudden it's taken away and then we can see. So that's kind of interesting how that comes from that. But whenever you say the word apocalypse, does that invoke happiness and, and oh man, yay, let's go have an apocalypse party. No, that's like end of the world stuff. It's like, oh, no, don't want that. It's called the book of Revelation. In English, it sounds way better because the revelation is a happy thing. Oh, we get to know. You know, somebody's having a baby or something. Oh, we get to know the revelation. Is it boy or girl? You've seen those videos on YouTube where it's a balloon and it explodes in their face and it's blue or pink or whatever. So we like the word revelation, but apocalypse is what the word comes from. And it does talk about end time events, apocalypse, bad things. So there's both good and bad in the book. And the good is I'm saved. I get out in chapter four. I go up at the rapture. I believe in a pre-trib rapture. I don't see us going through it. So, it's some past, some present, but a lot of future events. Let's go to Revelation 1, 19. Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Is that all past? <laughs> Doesn't sound like it. So, the things which are, that's present. Things thou hast seen. That sounds past, and which see have future. So past, present, future. So I see a lot of past, present, and future. So it's written to the church, but it's written about a lot of future events, which are for, believe it or not, Israel. And when we understand that from the beginning, then we rightly divide. And we won't try to find ourselves from here to here, because we're not there. We get out here at the rapture of the church, because God's telling the world, this is what's going to happen to you, because you did this to Israel, my people. God's not done with the Jews. How anyone could be so ignorant and say, no, no, replacement theology, God's done with the Jews. And yet they become a nation again in 1948? Really? You're not a preterist, are you? I mean, I mean you've got to, you're not a, a critical <laughs> scholar, are you? I mean, you've got to just hate the Bible to believe these kind of things. Yeah. Because that's foreign to what the Bible itself teaches. So when you get into the book of Revelation, guess what? There are a lot of sevens in the book of Revelation. We've got seven churches, seven spirits, seven angels, seven golden candlesticks, seven stars, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes, seven thunders, seven thousand men who were slain, seven crowns, seven plagues, seven vi I mean, can I keep going? I mean, I have to. Seven mountains, seven kings, seven trumpets, seven heads, seven lamps, seven other things. I didn't even write them all down. God must like the number seven. So when we get into this book and we look at all the sevens, there's a lot of sevens. And it makes you look at other sevens in the Bible. Remember, I've taught on there's only 7,000 years of human history. Yeah. And up until this point right here, that 6,000 have been done. That's the 7,000th year. God loves the number seven. So well, let's go to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1 through 3. This is what we would call the prologue. And this is the opening of it. And we read it earlier, but let's go ahead and read verse 1, and I'm going to comment on each verse. We're going verse by verse. The revelation, okay, not revelations, of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servant things which must shortly come to pass. Now, do you remember that verse back in, I think it's Matthew, where Jesus said, No man knoweth the day or hour. Remember that? If you read the rest of that verse, he says, But my Father which is in heaven. People are like parrots. You try to say, you know, the Bible tells us that, that the rapture's coming, and, and I think we could find it if it's in the Bible. No, you can't know when the rapture's coming. And yet, you read the book of Revelation, it says, 1,260 days, this happens. And the Bible's very specific, gives you how many. Yeah, I think it's in here. I think it's in here because Revelation 3.3 3 says, if you're not watching, you won't know. Well, it's the opposite of that. If you are watching, you will know, right? So I think you can figure it out. I haven't yet. But these people are like, no, no man know at the day or hour. Um, quote the rest of the verse, and they're like parrots. They're like, ah, no man knows the day or hour. Ah, no I mean, they just say it over and over and over. They get so mad at you when you say, no, I think you could figure it out if you read your Bible. No, no. And that's their verse that they cling on to. No man knows the day or hour. But Jesus said, no man knows the day or hour, but my Father which is in heaven. And he said that here on earth. Where did Jesus go? <coughs> to heaven. Amen. And do you think he went up there and sat down by the right hand of the Father, and they just kind of looked at each other and go, and they haven't talked since? Or do you think they spoke to each other? 
Well, according to this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, the Father, gave to him. So after he went up there, guess what? The Father goes, okay, let me tell you when the day and hour is. Let me tell you all this other stuff. And now you go tell John. Okay. That's how I see it. Why don't other people see that? Are they following a preterist, maybe? I don't, know. I don't know what's the problem with people not reading their Bible. They just love to follow other people and just parrot what they say. You need to study for yourself. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be what? Ashamed. I think these scholars, I think these preterists, I think these replacement theology people, I think they ought to be ashamed. You know, shame, shame, shame. We know your name. You don't know your Bible. Shame, shame, shame. Right? So I think we need to know it and read it. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, that would be the Father, gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. Now, an angel is an appearance. But Jesus is the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. So Jesus could have appeared as well to him also. Now, the servants, that would be us. We're servants. But you know who else would be servants? If you know your Bible, here comes the two witnesses, here comes 144,000. The last three and a half years of the tribulation, um, the Jews accept the Messiah, many of them, and they flee into the wilderness, chapter 12 of Revelation, and God protects them. So wouldn't they be servants too? So I think they'll be sitting around reading the book of Revelation out there in a place called Petra. I had a friend of mine years ago that went to Israel and he went to see Petra. And the tour guide told them, bring King James Bibles. And what did they do with the King James Bibles? They went out in the desert around there and they said, find a rock and hide it under the rock. There have been thousands of King James Bibles hidden under rocks all around out in that area. Why? Because the Christians are thinking, and when they go there in the tribulation, because the Bible says they'll go out one day and kick a rock and go, oh, what's this? And pick up the Bible and start reading the book of Revelation. And it'll be shown unto the servants of God at that time, the Jews, and they'll read it. So that, to me, I'm getting goosebumps. That's amazing, isn't it? How smart a lot of Christians are who read their Bible. Uh, so it says here in, in uh, verse um, 2, who bear record of the Word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that He saw. Now, I find this very interesting, who bear record. I didn't write down, but if you want to look it up, look up bear record, how many times that shows up in the Bible. It shows up, I think, five or six times, and it's usually John that says it. So that's very John <laughs> that wrote John and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, who bear record. Bear record of something. Who bear record of the Word of God. Now, what is the Word of God? The Bible. The Bible is the Word, lowercase w, but who is Jesus? The Word, capital W. Who bear record of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that He saw. Now, look what it says. He bear record of two things of the Bible, the Scriptures, the Word of God, and of the testimony of Jesus. What is the testimony of Jesus? Well, let's go over to Revelation 19 and verse 10. Another verse to show a preterist and say, nah, nah, you're wrong, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's almost laughable how ignorant some people are, and I don't want to put them down, but I, I have to either laugh or cry. <laughs> because if you read the Bible, you could not be one of those. Look at Revelation chapter 19 and look at verse, verse uh, 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and one of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Now watch this. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So he says here, the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is that? The spirit of prophecy. So what must this book be? A book of future prophecy. It's not completed and over. If we're saved, we have the testimony of Jesus. What can we do? We are actually prophesying when we tell people what the Bible says. Amen. Now, we don't get some special revelation where we go prophesy something else outside the Bible. There are people out there that claim to be prophets, and they say that, and they do that. I was talking to somebody the other day, and they said, Yeah, we went to this church, and this prophet said this or that, and then it didn't come to pass. Yeah, well, he didn't get that from the Lord, did he? Watch out for people running around and say they're a prophet. But if I'm up here preaching and I say, if you don't get saved, you're going to hell, what did I just do? Prophesied. Amen. Because that's where you're going to go. Not because I said so. The Bible says so. Right? So the spirit of prophecy. So that's what it says there in verse 2. Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, who bears record? John. John bore record of the word of God. So he must have written other books. 
That proves that the other books written by John were from John. What would they be? The book of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and then he wrote this book, Revelation. And of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Well, you know, the time is at hand. What does that mean? To God, it's only like two days. So it's not an error in the Bible. It's not a mistake. It's God's perspective. Yeah, yeah really, about two days of my time, it's going to happen. Yeah. But for us, we've been like, oh, how many generations in 2,000 years? I have no idea, but that's a bunch. That's a bunch. So it says, for the time is at hand. Now, blessed are those who what? Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear. And then what? Does it say keep? Amen. So read, hear, and keep. Do you read it? Do you hear it? Do you keep it? Do you know it says you'll get a blessing for that? Well, who doesn't want a blessing, right? <laughs> so I'm going to read the book of Revelation and I get a blessing from reading it, the Bible says. Amen. That's pretty incredible. If you want a blessing, then just read it. Um, let me show you another thing. Luke eleven twenty eight. 28. Luke chapter 11 and verse 28. And I don't have time to get into why we believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. But we know it is because it comes from the true text. It comes from the right text. Amen. All new versions come from the corrupt Alexandrian, Westcott and Hort, critical Catholic text. Yeah. And they're not the Word of God. And you're not blessed. If you want a true blessing, get the true Word of God, the King James Bible. New versions are perversions. Yeah. The non-inspired version, the NIV, isn't that what it stands for? Nutty Idiots version? No, no, uh, something. The NIV, I forget what it stands for. The NIV takes out over 60,000 words. Is that keeping God's Word? No. So are you really blessed if you use the NIV? Well, yes, I get a blessing from it. I don't. You take out whole verses. The verses are missing in it. God says you get a blessing if you keep it. Those that put that together did not keep it. Did you know there were two homosexuals that, that worked on the committee of the NIV? Can you believe that? Um, wow. So, blessed are they. Now, what does it say in um, Luke 11? And I believe it's verse 28. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God, and what? Keep it. So, I've got the King James Bible. I know that's the word of God. I don't want some perversion that's taking words out. New versions, they do that a lot. Jesus says, verily, verily. And they go, well, that's redundant. Let's just say verily. I want it when Jesus says very, very, because when Jesus says verily, verily, usually that's one of the most important things he's going to say. He's giving that as emphasis, like pay special attention to it because I'm saying it twice. Why would you want a version that takes it out once? Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word of God. You want to take away the words? Why don't you want to keep it? So there's a blessing for keeping God's word. Let's go to Revelation chapter 22. In verse 6 and 7, again, we read this. You get a blessing for reading this book. Why don't you read it from the King James Bible? Because if you read it in another version, it changes things. I don't want it changed. I want it as close to the originals as we can get. That's the King James. Because that comes from the true Byzantine text. All new versions come from the Catholic, corrupt, critical texts, which are from Alexandria, Egypt. And the Bible doesn't have much to say good about Egypt. Egypt always did wrong to Israel. But anyway... Uh, Revelation chapter 22, verse 6 and 7. And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Well, there goes your preterist. <laughs> they go, we don't need to keep that. It's already over. If it's already over, then, then we can't get a blessing. So you're trying to rob a blessing from me? I mean, how am I going to keep it if, if it's... <laughs> People just don't read, do they? They keep the prophecy of this book. So I want to keep it, don't you? So we get a blessing, the Bible says, for keeping it. But you know what you get if you don't keep it? A curse. Go to Revelation 22, 18 and 19. So you can choose if you want to be blessed or cursed. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Wow, does that mean COVID is because all the new versions in the Bible? <laughs> I don't know, man. But um, you shouldn't be adding to the Bible, but they keep making new versions, don't they? It, and they all change the Word of God. 
And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So it's a very serious thing. Don't mess with the Bible. You don't mess with the book. And yet people have. You need to study who Westcott and Hort was, who Lockman was, who Tischendorf was. Study these so-called scholars who chose the critical, messed up versions of the Bible to make their new translations from. Because those are not the true Word of God. Those are those that have been changed. And your new versions of the Bible come from them. There's three commands in the Bible not to change the Bible. Let's look at these three commands in the Bible. The first one is Deuteronomy 4. I think it's verse 1 and 2. Oh, it's actually verse 2. It's in the beginning of the Bible. Then we've got Proverbs chapter 30. And I want to say verse 5. Is that right? And then and 6. That's the middle of the Bible. And then we've got the end of the Bible. We just read it. Revelation 22. And what were those verses? 18 and 19. So you've got three commands in the Bible. And the first one's in the beginning of the Bible. The next one is in the middle. And the next one's toward the end. Yep. That just happened to happen when all these guys just wrote a book. No, God is the author of the Bible. And he had all these people write and put it all together. And God said, it's going the way I want it. And I'm going to tell you in the beginning. I'm going to tell you in the middle. I'm going to tell you in the end. Don't mess with this book. So let's read those real quick. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. And verse 2, to the Old Testament, God tells these Old Testament Jews, now we look at this as a command for us today, don't mess with it. And who was that guy? Frank Logston was his name that worked on the, which Bible was it? Um, the NASB. Have you ever seen the testimony of Frank, I think it was Lagston or something like that. He worked on the NASB Bible. And after he did, he recanted. And said, I'm sorry. And you can hear his testimony of how he said, I did the wrong thing in making this new version of the Bible. The King James is the right one. We did wrong. So that's amazing. I, don't know. I forget his name. But you can look it up. The NASB, I think his name, I'll have to find out what his name was. But it's interesting to hear the testimony of a man that put out a new version of the Bible and said, you know what? That's a perversion. I shouldn't have done that. So anyway, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. You shall not add unto the word which I command you. Neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. So here's a command God says not to change it. Now go to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. And in Proverbs chapter 30, here's another command. Middle of the Bible. Which, by the way, if you ever done a study on what's the first word in the Bible, what's the middle word in the Bible, and what's the last word in the Bible, you realize it's not in the middle, just one word, it's two, because the way it works out. And so it works out, the first word is in, the middle two words are the Lord, and the last word is amen. <laughs> it all boils down to, are you in the Lord, amen, or are you not? Isn't that wild? And that's only in the King James Bible, though. You can go use a different Bible, who knows what it says. <laughs> who knows, I've never done that. It probably says in Satan, amen, or something, it's weird, you know. But um, Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 5 and 6, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. You call God a liar when you change His word. That's right. And you stand in doubt of Him and say, well, I don't think He really said that. I think we should go with these texts over here. Oh, really, which one are those? The Vaticanus, ends in anus, that doesn't sound right. And the Sinaiticus. Sin? That's not. Those are the two texts that they take new versions from. One came out of the Vatican. Another one was forged by a man to make it look older than it really was. And it's missing a lot of words. Somebody didn't follow the Bible. They didn't keep it. They didn't want a blessing. And we're supposed to believe that we're getting a blessing from new versions of the Bible? What has happened when new versions came out? They started coming out in 1881 with the Westcott and Hort text. And the first one was the revised version in English of 1884. No other book has sold more copies than the King James Bible. No other book has brought revival in the world more than the King James Bible. Now you have over 200 different versions in English. And we're in what? The time of apostasy. Where's the revival? Someone's not keeping God's word. There's only one book. God only wrote one book. You go to the bookstore and say, I'd like some Shakespeare. Oh, which version of Shakespeare would you like? There's no such thing. It's Shakespeare. 
Why is it? Well, which version in English would you like of what God said? God only wrote one Bible. That's right. Oh, but there's different translations. Well, the only one that came from the true text in history when they had them all on the table from the men who were the smartest is the King James. And a king authorized it. Amen. Where the word of a king is, there is power. Ecclesiastes, Amen. what's the verse? I think it's 8, 4, if I remember right. Look that up. You want an authorized version? Or do you want a perversion that hasn't been authorized? you got to stick with the king. Ecclesiastes 8, 4. So, back to uh, Revelation. So, I want to stick with what the Bible says. Now, Revelation chapter 1. And uh, it's interesting. We've got a command in the beginning, in the middle, and the end. Beginning, Old Testament. Middle, I guess we could apply that spiritually to New Testament. Let's don't change it today. But then in the tribulation, they shouldn't be changing the Bible either. And I wonder if somebody will try to do that in the tribulation. Maybe some Jews will come along and go, no, 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 don't follow that King James. Over here in the NIV it says, can you imagine that? And then people will be like, shut up. Because they have the old Hebrew text. And you know what they say? The old Hebrew text read closer to the King James than any other translation. Duh. Even Jews know the King James is better. Hmm, interesting. But your scholars, a lot of them blockheads that are preterists, they, no, King James is not a reliable translation. Why don't you go stick your head in the sand and leave us alone? Amen. You know, like one guy said, take a long walk off a short pier, all right, bud? And, and just, oh, take your waterproof King James, though. <laughs> I remember I gave him a waterproof King James Bible. He thought it's so cool. This, the Bible's waterproof? You better not dip it in the pool just to check. But it's supposed to be the pages are waterproof. All right, so... Chapter 1 of Revelation, and we read verses 1 through 3, the prologue. Let's start there in verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in where? This is interesting because he starts out writing, and you can say this is past because this was literally seven churches that existed in the time of John. And so God in heaven is looking down at the time and says, I'm going to address these seven churches. Now, some of these were churches that Paul wrote to. Paul wrote to Ephesians, didn't he? There was a letter to Laodicea, but I guess it was lost. But in Colossians, it talks about that. Read the epistle to Laodicea. So these are the seven churches in Asia. Now, why is that important? Well, it's strange because let's go over to 2 Timothy 1.15. You remember 2 Timothy 2.15. What about 2 Timothy 1.15? When we get to this book, we see something very interesting. John, the apostle, is in a time of apostasy. It did not take long for the early church to go into apostasy. What did they do? They turned against Paul. Paul writes 2 Timothy. That's the last book he writes. Last full book that he writes. And it says in 2 Timothy 1.15, This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, and of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. So people in Asia turned against Paul. Why did they turn against Paul? Isn't that weird? Paul's our apostle. Romans eleven thirteen. 13. We're supposed to follow Paul. He said, be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. Three times, follow me. Folgen Shemir in German. So why all of a sudden are all these churches that are supposed to be following Paul not following Paul? And why are these the ones that he's writing to? I never found that in a commentary yet. Why didn't anybody talk about that? I, see, I try not to follow the commentaries of what man said. I try to study this for myself. But I did read a couple of commentaries on Revelation. And I, I said, Lord, I just want you to show me things, not man. And so why did this happen? Why did they turn away from Paul? Well, it doesn't say. It just tells us there's these two guys. Now, you could go into history and see what these two guys say and what they teach and everything. I forget what their heresy was. But God is looking at these churches like, why would they turn against Paul? They should be preaching Paul because Paul's gospel is the gospel that saves. As you read and we go through these churches, God goes, I know your works. I know your works. I wonder if they were bragging, saying, oh, our works save us. Well, then they departed from the true gospel that it's not of works. I don't have the answer why they turned from Paul. I don't know. But I find something very interesting. Look at the verse, Revelation 1-4. I believe, because I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist, I believe that God called Paul and gave Paul some revelations, some mysteries. You want a good study? Look at the seven mysteries in the Bible. And God revealed things to Paul. And when he did, the early church said, Okay, Paul, we'll accept that from Jesus Christ. And I clearly see in the Bible all the apostles getting together with Paul and accepting the doctrine given to Paul. That's what the Bible teaches. And when we read through Revelation, 
we see Paul in this book. So John didn't turn away from him. John wasn't in Asia. He was over here in an island of Patmos somewhere. I forget where it was, somewhere over here or someplace or over here. And he was on an island. So John didn't turn against Paul. And we see that in verse 5, the blood. Amen. And, but look at here what we see in verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace. Grace be unto you. So John the Apostle was a grace believer. <laughs> oh, every hyper dispensationalist head just exploded. But anyway, um, so Paul in most of his epistles, what did he say? Grace be unto you. So the message of Paul is we're saved by grace, yeah. right? Amen. So did they turn away from that message? When Paul says, all there have turned against me, is he saying they turned against the message of grace? Or is he saying they turned against me in teaching something that I don't? I don't know. I still try to figure out what that is. Did they turn away from him completely? Because one of the seven churches is Philadelphia, and God says, yeah, you're good. So maybe they didn't turn away from the true gospel, but they turned away from some of the other things of Paul. Or maybe they're just like, forget Paul, man, he's in jail. So we're just, and they just forgot him or something. I don't know. But it is interesting. So Paul ends many of his epistles with grace be unto you. Now, Paul was saved in chapter 9 of Acts. In Acts chapter 13, Paul is sent out as a missionary. And the problem with modern Christianity today is they leave out Paul. Yeah. If you leave out Paul, you leave out the gospel of salvation. Here is what Paul began to preach. Whenever it started, okay, the, the early church started, it was all about who Jesus was. And all throughout the early church, they're running around saying, hey, it's who he is. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. Believe who he is. Believe his name. Believe who he is. It's who, who, who Jesus is. And that was what the early church and the Jews believed, is they believed Jesus was their Messiah. With Paul, God said, Paul, I want you to not only tell him who I am, go tell him what I did for him. Because what did Jesus do? He died as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He shed his blood as the sacrifice for the sins. So the what message, what did Jesus do? He did that to save us by grace. And when you go to Acts chapter 13, verse 38... Paul begins preaching something that God revealed to him. And the thing that he starts preaching is the thing that the Catholic Church hates more than anything in the world. They slaughtered millions of people for preaching this because Martin Luther began to preach this. Why? Because he saw Paul preached it. It's called justification by faith, saved by grace through faith, not works. And in Acts chapter 13, verse 38 and 39, Be it known to you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. So he preached forgiveness of sins through Christ. Through what? Through his blood atonement. Amen. And justification. Justified by faith and not works. It's no, no longer are we under the law. Laura was reading me some comments as we're coming up here. And I just, I get so sad to see these comments of these Seventh-day Adventists. Oh, we're not under the law anymore. Oh, you're so silly. What do you mean? Christ abolished the law. And I'm like, yeah, that's what it says in Colossians. <laughs> Having abolished the law. Oh, no, we're still, we're. it's just like, dude, you read your Bible? That's Paul's message. We're not forgiven or justified by the law. We're forgiven and justified by Christ alone. Amen. So grace, salvation by grace. Well, when he preached this, that caused a big stink. And that's what chapter 15 of the book of Acts is all about. And they all met together in Acts chapter 15. Read chapter 15. These Jews come down and said, no, but you still got to be circumcised. Okay, maybe, maybe faith alone is enough, but still you got to be circumcised. And they said, no, no, it's not works. And guess who stands up and speaks first? Who's the guy that always opens his mouth first? Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater, right? Peter stands up and starts, well, let me say it. And it's like, oh, here we go again, Peter. And most of the time when he does that, God rebukes him. He's like, Peter, would you just listen, Peter? You know, but a lot of times he says good stuff. A lot of times he opens his mouth and inserts his foot. But Peter stands up and Peter says, verse 11, Acts 15, 11, Peter literally says, I accept Paul's message that we're saved by grace. And the early church was there minus James. And guess what? He says, yeah, yeah, Paul's right. Look what he says in verse 9, purifying their hearts by faith. So we're saved by faith alone. Verse 11, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So we're saved by grace, God's grace. So I see John preaching the message of grace. <laughs> huh? I see Peter as a grace believer. Amen. 
So, you know, I don't want to be hard on people. I'm not. But there's people called hyperdispensationalists is the name we put on them because they say, no, 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 Peter never accepted the message of Paul. They always preach two different messages. No, they all got on the same page. And you go to 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, what do you see? Redeemed through the blood of Jesus. That's Paul's message, justified by faith, faith in his blood, justified by the blood. So as we get to this book, we got to remember who it's written to in the beginning. It's written to, and this is past, these uh, seven churches. Churches that Paul says turned against them. Now, did they turn against the gospel? I hope not. <laughs> I hope they didn't. But they turned against Paul for one reason or another. And in context, is because two guys started preaching something else. So it sounds like they became followers of them instead of Paul or something. I don't know. But we see John at least sticking with the message of Paul. So let's go back to Revelation. And so that's why we can read Revelation today. Your preterists say, no, you don't need to read it because it's already passed. Well, a lot of hyper-dispensationalists say, no, you don't need to read it because it's so future that it's not even for us at all. <laughs> so grace isn't for us at all? Yeah, it is. Where's grace in the tribulation? <laughs> in the tribulation, it's way different than, than grace. So um, you better read the whole Bible, okay? And rightly dividing is saying, hey, where does it all apply to me? Because not all of it does, but I want what does. And when we get to Revelation 1.5, that's me. <laughs> that's me, Revelation 1.5. And that's important. That's a great verse. So Revelation chapter 1, and verse 4, it says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace. That sounds just like Paul. Grace be unto you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. Many times he says it. And it says, which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now look what it says there. Grace unto you and from him. Who is him? Jesus Christ. And it says what? Which is, which was, and which is to come. All right. Now we're getting into Jesus being eternal. Jesus is forever. He is, okay? He is now, all right? He rose from the dead. He is alive. And it says there, which is, which was. Well, he was here on the earth and is to come. Is Jesus coming back? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So he is to come. So that's clearly who Jesus is. He says, I am, that I am. He's the I am. But look what it says there. It says, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now, there's some stuff in Revelation that you just read and you just go, blah, 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 blah. what the heck is that? What is that? What are the seven spirits? There's only one Holy Spirit. Well, God is one God, but he can manifest himself as three, as a father and as a son and as a spirit all at the same time. So God can do that. So can the Holy Spirit do that? Manifest itself as seven different ones? I guess. I don't know. I don't want to talk too dogmatically about this because I don't know. And there's a lot in the book of Revelation I don't know. And I won't know until we get to heaven. What is this thing with seven eyes? You know, what is this thing uh, with seven, uh, not, not seven wings, but seven. I mean, there's a lot of these seven things. And you're looking at this going, well, I don't know what that is. But when we get to heaven, we'll go, oh, now I get it. So he tells us what he saw, but we don't always understand it. So what the heck is seven spirits? Well, we read about that later, and it has to do with the churches and things like that. But maybe it's the Holy Spirit that can seven different ways present itself. I don't know. You know, there's seven colors in a rainbow, but it's one rainbow, but it can split into seven. So maybe the, and that's light, isn't it? Huh? The Holy Spirit is light. Well, I don't know what this is, but Revelation 4, 5 says this. Revelation 4, 5. It's wonderful to read over and over and over the book of Revelation because it says one thing over here, it says another thing over there. For example, it says the seven angels. And then another place says the seven angels are seven stars. So angels are stars? That's interesting. Well, here in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. How does God have seven spirits? I thought He was one, the Holy Spirit. Well, somehow the Holy Spirit can manifest into seven. I don't know how. But if you think about it, every one of us that's saved, we have the Holy Spirit in us. How many spirits is that? I mean, let's say there's 80 million people saved in the world. Is that 80 million different Holy Spirits? No, it's one Holy Spirit, but in that many different places at one time. So I don't have a problem with the Spirit of God being able to manifest itself in other ways. But what are the seven spirits? Well, for years people have asked that question and tried to figure it out. I don't know. I'll give you a, a thought on it that some have, and maybe this could be it. But then again, maybe not. <laughs> we'll see. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. I think that it's the Holy Spirit, 
manifesting itself in seven different ways at one time. And it has to do with light, and the Spirit has to do with wind. It has to do with a lot of things. But in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1 and 2, look what it says. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch, capital B, shall grow out of his roots. Who would that be? That's Jesus Christ, the branch. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Okay? Now watch this. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So if you take the first one as the Spirit of rest, then there's seven there. The Spirit of rest, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. So that might explain... I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. But I find that very interesting that there just happens to be. But what does that all have to do with? Wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge. Well, the Bible is like light. And a fire is light. And so to me, it's like illumination. The Holy Spirit of God is to illuminate us. The devil counterfeits that. He wants the illuminati. Naughty. They are naughty, all right. You know, bad. The Illuminati. I think they should spell it the way they really are. But the Illuminati wants illumination. Your secret societies. What do they do? Oh, we, it's our secret illumination. Come to us for the, for the hidden light masonry. So they're counterfeiting the true thing. The true thing is light. Psalms 119, 130. Let's look at some verses about this. And when uh, you look at the Bible, you see that God is light and in Him is no darkness. And the Holy Spirit's job is to illuminate and lighten things. The Word of God is like light. But the Holy Spirit opens our eyes the more we read it and shows us things. You, you can't understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. It's there to guide and lead you. But uh, Psalms 119, 130 says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Now look at Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And we're turning to a lot of verses here, but I want you to get these. Are you all having a good time? Amen. Isn't it fun to study the Bible? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. So these seven spirits, what on earth? I mean, I read through there, I'm like, I don't, I don't get it. But if the Spirit is the Holy Spirit and He can manifest in seven different ways, well, okay, maybe. Maybe that helps understand why it's a candlestick, because a candlestick is for light. But in verse 17, Ephesians 1, 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Well, that sounds like Isaiah back there, right? And it has to do with the spirit. And then it says in verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. So there you go. So it's the eyes of understanding being enlightened. But the Spirit is what enlightens us, gives us revelation. Okay? So take away a veil. If you've got a big black cloth over you, you can't see, you take it off, you see what? First thing you see, light. So it's light. Let's go back to uh, Psalms 119, 105. Psalms 119, 105. So this is uh, interesting. And as I read through the Bible, I get more questions than answers sometimes. <laughs> and it just makes me want to read more because I want my questions answered. Psalms 119, 105. Thy word is a what? Unto my feet and a light unto my path. Who wrote the Bible? The Holy Spirit inside of the believer moved. The Bible says as they were moved of the Holy Ghost. Moved the lips. Sometimes moved the hand, I think. And had them write down whose words? God's word. And the word of God is like light. Let's see that. Let's go to 2 Peter 1, 19. So the Bible is light. Did you know that? Yes. And so the Spirit is like a candle, like light. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. Now look at this. 2 Peter 1, 19. We're studying the book of what? Revelation. And the book of Revelation is about prophecy. 2 Peter 1, 19 but we have also a more sure word of prophecy. More sure than what? Verse 18, a voice from heaven. <laughs> what is our more sure word of prophecy? The Bible. This book in my hand is more sure than if I heard a voice shouting down from heaven. I'd question that voice. I'm like, who's that? I mean, are you, are you sure you're God? Because this I know is God. 
but I don't know if that's the devil tricking me or not. I'd rather use this than a voice. You ever talk to people say, I heard a voice. I'm like, okay, the insane asylum's that way. I mean, I don't want people talking and saying they hear voices. That, that scares me. This is the only voice I need is the Word of God. And it says in 2 Peter 1, 19, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light, look at that, that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So the Bible is like a light that shines in a dark place. So we have lights on in here, but we have lights on in the spirit world when we have this open in our lap. <laughs> and in our hearts, it shines light into our hearts. Isn't that amazing? Go to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. So I thank God for the light. Daniel chapter 5. And look what it says in Daniel chapter 5 and verse 11. Daniel 5, 11. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Now, who is speaking? Well, Belshazzar, which is a pagan. So he doesn't know any better. And he says, and he's talking about Daniel. That guy, man, he's got a spirit in him of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom. Weird. The spirit of God is like a light inside of you. Like the wisdom of the gods was found in him. All right. And I think we have another verse, verse 14. I have even heard of thee that the spirit of the gods is in thee. Well, we know that wasn't the spirit of gods. That was the spirit of the Holy Spirit of God is in thee. And that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. So if you want to be wise and you want to understand and you want to be knowledgeable, you need the Bible. Amen. You need to follow this book. And what's sad to me is there are many people who claim to be Christians and pastors. They spend most of their time reading the books of men rather than reading the book of God. A lot of your pastors in the pulpit, well, let me tell you what this guy says in his commentary. I try to get away from reading commentaries because that's what some man says the Bible says. I can go to the Bible itself and see what it says. I don't need you, right? I got the Holy Spirit that says in the Bible will guide and lead me unto all truth. Why do I need to know what you have to say about it? Who cares what your opinion is? You know? Yes, there's some good commentaries out there, but you've got to watch out. The best commentary is the Bible itself. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 1, and I have to try to figure out where to stop this for next week. Um, hopefully, I want to make sure we finish up next week as well with chapter 1 if we can. And I'm going to do my best to go through the book of Revelation. I'll tell you, I don't know everything in that book, and I'll point out things that I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but I'll try to show you what I do understand. So what are these seven spirits? There's something to do with light. They're candlesticks. And it says they're the Spirit of God. So somehow the Holy Spirit can manifest in seven different ways. There's another seven in the Bible. And it has to do with light. It has to do with understanding and knowledge. If you want to understand, read your Bible. It's a light. Thy word is a light unto my path. Or how's that go? I forget. And a lamp unto my path. So verse 5 and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's one of my dad's favorite verses. And that is Paul. How can that not be Paul? Paul preached through faith in his blood, Romans 3.25. The beginning of the King James Bible. If you have the old edition, you can read their preface. And it says, through faith in his blood. They even understood, you got to trust the blood to be saved. It's all about trusting the blood. And you know, new versions don't talk about that. They change Romans 3.25 to where you almost don't even understand it. It's crazy. So it says Jesus Christ is three things. A faithful witness, he's the first begotten of the dead, and he's the prince of the kings of the earth. Now maybe that's a good place to stop there because we've got to get into this prince. We've got to get into not only is Jesus a prince, he's the king. So it's interesting it says, and the prince of the kings of the earth. How is a prince over a king? You're a prince before you're a king. But later in the book, Jesus is the king of kings and lord of lords. How can he be a prince and a king at the same time? Well, he can, and he was, and he is. So we'll stop there, I guess, and we'll continue next time. But, but just read verse 6 with me real quick. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So that term, washed in His blood. When we're saved, we're blood washed. Our soul is washed. Our sins are washed away in the blood of Jesus. And I'll probably get into that more next time. But what a blessing that is. 
He loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood, and someday we'll be kings and priests. When will we be kings? Over here. When are we priests? Here. Priesthood of the believer. We do not need some man going around saying, Call me Father. And he's dressed like your mother with a long dress on. That's what it looks like to me, a big long dress. We do not need a man to get us to God. Do we? So why do they have priests in certain so-called churches if we're the priests? Many of those priests, they don't get married. The Bible says the husband and one wife. They disobey the Bible again. And many of them do what? They fall into sin and molest children and altar boys and things like that. Very sad, very sad. So we'll start there. We'll look at more into this next time. I guess we can take a couple questions if anybody has a question or anything. Not me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anybody else? Any questions or comments? Yes, sir. I one time did a study on, on the seven spirits of you know, Isaiah 11. Mm -hmm. you know, so I, I clearly see like how the Holy Spirit can get divided. And since God is all wisdom, He is all understanding, He is all, so I clearly see like there's a good possibility, even though it's seven spirits, each one displays his own characteristic. That makes sense. I forgot to say the first one is the spirit of rest. Yeah. When you're saved, what do you get? You rest. Well, before you're saved, you're all like, oh, I'm hoping I go to heaven. I'm trying my best. I'm when you realize, I can't work my way there. Hey, he saved me when I believed. Then you're like, now I know I'm going to heaven. Amen. That's yeah. peace that brings the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit. So what a blessing it is to rest in the Lord. Amen. All right, good, good. Anybody else? Actually, I okay. John the youngest? Yes, and we saw that in our verse-by-verse verse through John study, but yes. Yeah. And he's the one that laid on the breast of Christ. So he's the youngest. So how weird that would look today. I mean, you know, with another man and, and I'm out and we're eating and he goes, let me lay on your chest, brother Rick. I'd be like, <laughs> people be like, what are they? So he had to have been probably a teenager or a, a pre-teenager. And he just looked up to Jesus like a big brother. And so he was the youngest. So clearly he could have written around 100 AD or 90 AD. But a lot of people that make fun of the Bible say, well, he would have been 100 years old. Yeah, and so? <laughs> My grandmother lived to be 94. I mean, uh, a lot of people can live to be over 100 years old. And he was protected by God supernaturally because of that to write the book. Amen. How old was Sarah when she had a baby? Duh, that's called a miracle. God does those, right? So there's no problem with him. And if he was the youngest... Jesus was born in 0 A.D., died at 33. Well, what if he was, you know, 15 or 20 or something? He'd only be 80 years old, right? So there's no problem with that. And you go by what the history shows in the Bible. Yes, he was the oldest, and he was looked up to as the aged or the elder, John the elder, like he says in 1 John. And he was the last one that was alive of the apostles. And don't you know he was still on board with Paul? Amen. Uh, yeah, I think he was. So, amen. Anybody else? All right, we'll close there. Thank you for being with us.